be reading this morning from Luke 18, beginning in verse 35. Some may want to turn there as we'll be there later. Luke 18, beginning in verse 25. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who were in front of him rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people when they saw it, gave praise to God. Father, we also want to give praise to you. We praise you for what you did for this man. We praise you for what it represents. We praise you for what you have done for us and through us and what you have yet to do. We praise you because we love you. We praise you because of who you are and what you've done. We praise you for loving us. We praise you for being just and holy, guaranteeing that one day evil will be done and sin will be done away and things will be made right. Thank you for all of that. and We praise you for it. We worship you for it. Father, we come before you knowing we are dependent for many things, and uh, you've asked us to pray, and we pray often, and uh, Lord, this morning, we, it seems like we've had more than our share of uh, things going on this week, just kind of physical disabilities with Marianne's appendicitis and Bob's wrist and Carson's foot, and the list kind of goes on and on, and Lord, I I pray that you would meet the physical needs. They are important. But Lord, we are far more interested in the spiritual needs. We realize the need to be enlightened by your Holy Spirit, to understand you, to understand your word. We realize the need to live with obedience to you. We realize the need to pray for the encouragement and the strength of those who are representing you around the world on our behalf. Lord, we're so thankful for the things you give us to be involved with, for people like Daniel Surrett and his family in Israel who are sharing the gospel in a difficult place where it's not unusual for them to find that people are throwing stones at them because they are sharing the gospel of Christ. And yet, they are seeing more fruit from your word than ever, And we pray for them. We pray for these boxes that will be going shortly. We pray that you will put it on our hearts, Father, to give generously. Thank you for how you put ministries like that on the hearts of people like Dee and like the Resource Center that you place on Leslie's heart. And we all get to participate and to be part of what you're doing. And Lord, we pray that you will continue to Give us opportunities. You'll give us hearts that will want to reach out to others to be generous. We pray, Lord, as you know, we're, our own budget is running a bit behind this year, and we pray that you'll put it on the hearts of your people to help make sure that that comes right by the end of the year. Continue to pray, Father, for the building fund. Thank you for the recent changes to really kind of scope this out in a way that uh, we think will make more sense and allow it to happen sooner. And we look forward to sharing that with the congregation soon. And we pray that you will, or just give us the added uh, boost that we need to get there on something we believe you have truly put before us to do. More than anything, we pray for the people that would benefit. We pray for our children. We thank you for this mob that we see every week. We're so grateful for each one. 
Help us to learn to know them by name. Help us to encourage them in every way we can. Help us to pray for them. Lord, we, uh, we pray that you will build us to be a community who love each other. We realize that the first step of evangelism is that people would see that we love each other because you've given them the right to look at us and to say, do they love each other or not? Because by that, all men will know that we are your disciples if we have loved one for another. They can only see that if we are exhibiting it, and we pray that will be true. Help us now as we examine your word. It is your word. It is not our word. It is not our opinions. It is your word to us. And I pray that, Lord, the, the, um, the weight of that will impress upon us how much we need you, how gracious you have been to share yourself with us in this way. Teach us by your Holy Spirit and then lead us to be doers of the word and not hearers only, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in Luke 18, the passage we've just read about this blind man. You remember the context. Jesus has noted that it's hard for rich people to enter the kingdom of God. And then he has made this, uh, had this statement to this question from the disciples in verse 26 of Luke 18. The disciples say, well then, if rich people, it's hard for them to enter the kingdom of God, then who can be saved? But he said to them, what is impossible with man is possible with God. His point is quite clear. Salvation is not by human effort. And then he reminds his disciples of his own pending suffering and death and resurrection that will come shortly as he arrives in Jerusalem. That suffering and death and resurrection provide the objective basis for the salvation that he has been talking about and that he has been preaching and that was the, is the basis for qualification for entry to the kingdom that he's talking about since he arrived on earth and began his ministry. The objective basis. Without that, the rest could not happen. If there is no payment for sin that Jesus is going to make, then there is no salvation. But with that, as a foundation, then Luke is going to show us from the lives of two people who can be saved. The disciples have just asked that question, who can be saved? It turns out it can be a poor, helpless, blind man who had absolutely no hope. Uh, for his own life, or it can be a very rich, arrogant man, as we will see in chapter 19, or the main point is it can be anybody who will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The hard part is done. The death, the resurrection, the suffering of Jesus on our behalf. So what is impossible with man is possible with God. Now, as often is the case in the Gospels, and we've seen this before, Jesus uses a physical uh, ailment, a physical limitation, blindness in this case, to represent a spiritual reality. And the reality represented by this blind man is that every person outside of Jesus Christ is spiritually blind. They have blinders on. As you who have been around horses are aware, these are used on occasion, to get them not to know what's going on around them so that they can be led. And here is somebody who has spiritual blinders on who cannot see spiritual realities. This is someone who is in the same shape as what Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, when he says this. He says, in their case, that is, unbelievers, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Christ is literally hidden from unbelievers. Beloved, those of us who know Jesus, don't you imagine if everybody really understood who he is, the wonder of what he has done, they would certainly fall at his feet. But there are blinders. And just as surely as Jesus was hidden from this man physically, he is hidden from those who are outside of Christ spiritually. Unbelievers are like the guy who 
you know, saw a lady out in the distance, he hollered at her, hey, cousin, and she turned around and it wasn't his cousin at all, right? She looked like his cousin from behind. She had the same hairdo, the same clothing, the same shape. Looked for all the world like his cousin, but she was not. So after he had made his apologies, realized he had not seen her correctly, she accepted the apologies, and then she opened her purse and gave him a card that said, Helen Miller, optometrist. I guess she thought she had a good candidate for help there. Well, Jesus is going to help this man in an absolutely amazing way. He is a spiritual optometrist at the at the risk of being flipped there. This is what Jesus does. Jesus, you're going to see this. Jesus helps this man see before he can actually see. He gives him insight into spiritual things that he can see spiritually before he ever is able to see physically. And what I think we can see in this passage is how Jesus can take the spiritual blinders off and how we can cooperate with him in that process. Blood, if when we're blind spiritually, we can't see what we can't see. So it's important that we understand how the blindness can be corrected. So let's take a look at what this man saw before he could see. Number one. He saw himself clearly. He saw himself clearly. In Matthew's parallel account of this, Matthew 20, Matthew tells us that there were actually two blind men. You may have noticed that several times in the book of Luke, he'll mention just one main character when there were actually more than one that were present. And he's done that again. It was a common thing in those days. Mark tells us in his parallel account in Mark 10 that his name was Bartimaeus, and the name of this one was Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus knew that he had a problem. Bartimaeus knew that he was blind. He was a beggar because of it. And when he thought that there might be help available, when he saw that there may be help on the way, he jumped at the chance, literally, to try and take advantage of it. It says, and he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, we don't know how long Bartimaeus had been blind. We're not told. The, ver the words that are used later in the passage, it says either, it says recover your sight can mean either to gain or to regain. You can't tell from the original word whether he was blind from birth or whether he became blind later on. Either way, he knew he had a problem. But it strikes me, if you think about this for a moment, it would be interesting if he had been blind from birth, Think about somebody who's blind from birth. If you've been blind from birth and there's nobody around to describe what sight is, you wouldn't even know you were blind, would you? As far as you're concerned, there'd just be four physical senses. You wouldn't realize that there's a fifth one that you're missing out on. We don't know if that was the case with Bartimaeus, but somewhere along the line, he'd certainly come to understand that he was blind had he not known that, he would have never sought help. That's the point. And whether he just never knew it or whether he refused to acknowledge it, he wouldn't have sought help. That's where spiritual blindness is so devastating. Because most people who are spiritually blind don't know they are spiritually blind. No one has told them or someone has told them and they refuse to believe it or the God of this world, as Paul mentioned in 2 Corinthians 4, has managed to keep the blinders on them. And they don't seek help because they don't know they have a problem. Until you know you have a problem, you won't seek help. No one will ever be saved until they know they need to be, right? You don't seek help unless you know you need it. And until we see ourselves in light of the amazing, wonderful holiness of God that we fall so far short of and see ourselves as those who truly do fall short of it, as good as we may be, as wonderful to other people as we are, as much as we try to do the right things, to see ourselves as those who fail utterly before a holy God, 
we will never seek a solution to the problem that plagues us. Denying a problem, however, does not erase it, does it? Denying a problem doesn't do away with it. A few of you may remember Ken Caminiti, I, I bet not many, 15 years, a big league third baseman. One of the best for a period of time. In fact, in 1996, he was the National League most valuable player, Ken Caminiti. Played most of his career with the San Diego Padres. He became known again in 2002 after he had retired when Tom Verducci wrote in Sports Illustrated of, quote, the first public admission of steroid use by a prominent former player. Ken Caminiti revealed to Sports Illustrated that he won the 1996 National League Most Valuable Player Award while on steroids. Caminiti started taking them when he had a shoulder injury in 1996. And by his own admission, by the end of the year, he had gotten deeply into not only the use of steroids, but other drugs. They had such an effect on him that he had many side effects, stopped producing his own testosterone. Some of the side effects included even the loss of sexual function. Ken Caminiti said this in 2002, I've made a ton of mistakes. I don't think using steroids is one of them. Really? I don't think steroids is one of them. 2002. 2004, Ken Caminiti died at the ripe old age of 41. Drug overdose. Denial, beloved, doesn't do away with the problem. Spiritual blindness is the condition of everyone outside of Christ, and denying it does not solve the issue. And so the first step in removing those blinders is to acknowledge, maybe, just maybe, I have a problem. The Bible says it this way. It says, the soul who sins shall die. That's what it says, Ezekiel 38. The soul that sins shall die. And what God is doing in his grace, not because he wants to condemn us, not because he hates us, not because he is against us. He is graciously telling us, you have sin, then you have a problem. You will die. You will die physically and you will die spiritually. You will spend an eternity separated from me because of the sin of your soul. The soul that sins, it shall die. This is your condition outside of Christ. He's helping us see reality. And the blind man's first step in getting the blinders removed from his eyes was to see himself for who he really was. So must we. Second thing that the blind man saw, he saw the Savior clearly. Saw himself clearly. And then secondly, he saw the Savior clearly. Now this is quite interesting I don't think he knew everything about Jesus, do you? There's no indication that he had ever been around him before. I almost said saw him before. We know that, right? Hadn't seen him before. No indication he'd ever been around him before. But I'll tell you what, he knew a lot for a blind man, and he believed it all. He believed it all. Look what this passage says. He, you know, he's, he's come this morning. He's taking his place at the begging station, and the crowd's going by. So he's, he asks the question, what's going on? And they say, well, Jesus of Nazareth is passing. Jesus of Nazareth. That's all they say, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus not only came from Nazareth, which was up in Galilee in the north part of Palestine, most of his ministry had been up in Galilee in the north part of Palestine, which was not the zip code for this guy. This guy is in Jericho down south. Just a little bit east of Jerusalem. But watch his reaction when he's told Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, verse 38. He cried out, Jesus, son of David. Jesus, 
son of David, have mercy on me. Why is that important? I'll tell you why that's important, beloved, because here's a guy that's just known to the physical world as Jesus from Nazareth, just like you would say Peter from Capernaum. Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, and he says Jesus, son of David, and Jesus, son of David, was a first century, to the Jewish population in the first century, was unquestionably a messianic title. He saw Jesus for who he was. He saw Jesus for the Messiah that he was. All of, the, all of that title, Son of David, goes back to the promise of God in 2 Samuel chapter 7. So let's turn there. 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is called the Davidic Covenant. Any of you who have studied the Bible, some realize that the Bible is a series of covenants, promises that God makes to various people at various times. And in 2 Samuel we have what is called the Davidic covenant. David has decided, the king, that he wants to, that he wants to build a, a temple for God. He wants to build a building for God. And God basically says, no, David, you're not going to build the temple. You're a man of blood, and I don't want you building my temple, but I'll tell you what, I will build a house for you. You're not going to build my house, but I'm going to build a house for you. And here's what he says in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. He says, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Who in the world is he talking about? Well, he's talking about Samuel, first of all, who built the house, but he's talking way beyond Samuel when he says, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That's Jesus. That's the greater son of David. So the, 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 the Jews of Jesus' time understood that to be a prophecy of the ultimate Messiah, the ultimate Mashiach, the anointed one, would be in the line of David, would be someone who would come along and would one day rule on David's throne forever. This was their great hope. I don't doubt that Bartimaeus knew this. Bartimaeus may have also known the passage that Jesse read for us from Isaiah 35, where it says that that same Messiah, that the, that the eyes of the blind would be healed by him. So he says, Jesus, son of David. How did he know that? Where did he get that information? How could he have understood that this Jesus of Nazareth who just happens to be walking by is the Messiah? Well, we can't know for sure. I think, but, but I think we can speculate. We know that by this time, as Jesus is heading to Jerusalem and he's you know, just about to get there, believe it, we, we started that journey, that six-month journey in, uh, in chapter 9, verse 50 of Luke, and we're going to get to the end of it very shortly here in chapter 19. But as he's heading on that last trip to Jerusalem, his reputation had preceded him. This blind man had doubtless heard about this Jesus of Nazareth. He had heard about the teaching and how people were saying, this man teaches as one as authority. He's not like the scribes and Pharisees who keep quoting this guy and that guy. He speaks with authority. He preaches hard. He knew about the miracles because, you know, as many as, as the few that we have in the Gospels are just a very small representative sample. John says if, there, if everything that Jesus did was written down, I don't think the books of the world could hold it all. Now, I'm sure it's an exaggerated statement, but you get the point. Jesus was out there healing people, preaching to people every single day for three years. People by the thousands, literally all over Palestine, had been healed by Jesus. And he knew that. He had heard this. And some combination of that message and the work of God in his heart had produced faith. Isn't that the way it always happens? Isn't that the way the Bible tells us it will happen? Doesn't Romans 10, 17 say, and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. How did Bartimaeus know this? Because he had heard the word of Christ. So the little word that he had heard, coupled with the bits of Scripture that he knew, ministered by the Holy Spirit, produced faith in an open heart that knew it needed help. The blind beggar sees the Savior clearly. You know, it's interesting. In his blindness, 
he saw the Savior a lot more clearly than the Pharisees who had made a study of the Scriptures all their life. The Pharisees who had been following Jesus for the last three years, trying ways, find ways to pick him apart. The Pharisees who had more knowledge, probably, of Jesus than anyone in their time outside of the disciples. And yet they couldn't see him for who he is, but this blind man does. Similar to be healed of spiritual blindness, beloved, we have to see Jesus for who he is. It's not enough. Listen carefully. We've said this time after time, but it's not enough to put him on the pantheon of the great heroes of ancient times. It's not enough to say he was a nice guy and a, maybe even a great prophet. It's, it's amazing what he did with the little bit that he had. That Jesus must have been something. It's not enough. We have to see him by the title that God gave him when he came to earth, which was what? Emmanuel, with us, God. Yes, he's a man. Yes, he sweats like you do. Yes, he had pain. Yes, he got tired. Yes, he drank and ate and did all the things that people do because he was a man, but he was also God clothed in human flesh. He was the God-man. He was like no one else. You know, one of my heroes, and he should be your hero too, although you may not know it, is a man named Athanasius. Athanasius lived in the 300s AD. Athanasius spent his life, he really literally spent his life, 50, 60 years, fighting against another theologian named Arius. Arius was a theologian who did not believe in the deity of Christ. He believed that, God, that Jesus was certainly a great being, that he was, a high, he was to be revered as being a, a high form of creation of some kind, but he did not believe that he was God. And you'll recall, some of you know a little bit of history, you'll recall that the Roman Empire by 325 under Constantinople had become Christian officially. The emperor had declared, we will be a Christian nation, but the emperors who followed, some went along with that and some didn't. Arius was a very personable guy, likable. He would worm his way into court of the latest emperor and he would convince this emperor that he had truth and he would convince him that Athanasius was wrong when he said that Jesus was God and the church as a whole was being dragged down this road that said Jesus is something, he's a great person, but he's less than God. And Athanasius kept insisting, no, 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 he is God in the flesh. He, he argued over one letter. The letter was the letter I. The letter I. Arius said, Jesus is homo eusius. Homo eusius, the Greek word that means of like substance to God. And Athanasius was saying, no, no, you got to get the I out of there, Arius. He's not homo eusius, he's homo eusius. He is of the same substance of God, not of like substance. Athanasius kept, he was, a, he was a bishop in Constantinople, but he kept getting exiled. A new emperor would come in and he would get exiled. And then he would come back and he would get exiled again. He spent his life doing that. Somebody told him one time, Athanasius, give it up. Don't you realize the whole world is against you? And he said, then let me tell you, I am against the whole world. On his tombstone, it says, Athanasius, contra mundum, against the world. Because he stood for Christ. Thankfully, Athanasius won the day. Thankfully, we can now understand, as the Bible had always said, Athanasius says, you know what he did? He just went back to the Bible. He said, don't you see this in the Bible? Don't you see that Jesus is very God? He's in the form of God. According to Philippians 3, Colossians 1.19, he's, the, he's the, in him all the, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Don't you realize that he created all things? Hebrews 1, John 1. Don't you realize that he accepted worship? Don't you realize that he accepted forgiveness? Nobody can do that or would do that except God. Jesus is God. Jesus cannot be your Savior until you recognize him for who he is. He's God. And once the blind man 
realized who Jesus was, I think it's interesting. He, nothing was going to keep him away. Notice in verse 39, those who were in front rebuked him, telling him, be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Listen, he wasn't, he wasn't saying, this is too hard. I can't do this. This is going to cost me too much. I can't do this. It'd be too humiliating. All these people, I'm going to bother them. They don't, they're not going to like me if I do this. He didn't do any of that. He just laid himself out and demanded to have an audience with God because he recognized Jesus for who he was. Do you know Jesus that way? I think of Ignatius of Antioch. He was, a, he was a disciple of John the Apostle. Wouldn't it be something to have been a disciple of one of the apostles? Here's Ignatius was. He wrote this of real possibilities in his day. He said, let fire and the cross, let the crowds of wild beasts, let tearings, breakings, and dislocations of bones, let cutting off of members, let shattering of the whole body and let all the dreadful torments of the devil come upon me. Only let me attain to Jesus Christ. Nothing would stand in his way and nothing did stand in his way. And he did suffer martyrdom because of his faith in Christ. Would you do that? Does Jesus mean that to you? We have it so easy. That's why we should be, we should be wary of easy believism. Because easy believism isn't real believism. Bartimaeus had the mindset, Jesus is God and I will not be stopped. Someone asked Helen Keller, isn't it terrible to be blind? You know, this blind deaf woman. She said, she said better to be blind and see with your heart than to have two good eyes and see nothing. I beg you this morning, see Jesus for who he is. If you're not sure, if you don't understand, ask him to reveal himself to you. Which really leads to our next point. He saw himself clearly. He saw the Savior clearly. He saw the solution clearly. He saw the solution clearly. Before he could even see physically, he saw the solution clearly. What was the solution? To cast himself on God's mercy. Verse 38, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. Verse 39, Son of David, have mercy on me. This guy knows that he brings nothing to the party. He was not able to heal himself. Neither does he offer to Jesus, look, Jesus, you ought to heal me because I, listen, I, see this other guy that's here with me? I'm taking care of him. Who do you think's paying his way? Jesus, I, I do a lot of things for the people that are around me. Jesus, I go to synagogue every week. Jesus, you owe me. Nothing like that. Son of David, have mercy on me. He begs for mercy because he understands that's the solution. He doesn't seek the solution through his merit. He seeks the solution through mercy. I need mercy. Mercy is throughout the New Testament because it's the only way to God. Mercy and what Jesus does is absolutely amazing. Think about this. Here's one insignificant Poor blind guy. He's been sitting out there. Some of you who were with us when we went to uh, Jericho will remember. It's just this old desert place. Remember, we got stuck in one place. They could hardly get the bus turned around, Jericho. I was glad they got it turned around. I didn't want to stay there. Not a pleasant place. And here's this man, and he's been there forever, and he goes out on his dirt pile every morning. It's going to be hot before the end of the day. Insignificant. The world has passed him by. Been there for years. And he asks, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stops. Don't you love that? Jesus stops. Now think about who this is, beloved. This is Jesus who, according to John 1, 3, created all things. And without him was not anything created that was ever made. This is Jesus who, according to Hebrews 1, was the creator of all things. This is Jesus who, according to Colossians 1.17, holds all things together. This is Jesus in whom all the fullness of the Godhead dwells. This is Jesus that made everything. And that Jesus stops. 
because one insignificant person asks for mercy. Jesus, the creator of the universe, responds to the request for mercy, beloved. We need to come and ask for mercy because we need mercy. We cannot come pleading our own merit. We cannot come saying, you owe me. But one cry for mercy stops the Lord of everything in his, in his, in his tracks. And what's interesting to me is he not only does it stop the Lord of the universe cold in his tracks, but then he put himself completely at the disposal of the one seeking help. The one who is the Lord of the universe became the servant of the most insignificant part of his creation because what does he say? What do you want me to do? Heal me? Take away my blindness? You know, it doesn't matter whether we've never come by faith to Christ or not. We need to do that by faith. We need mercy. But even as a believer, we need mercy every day. We need mercy. Beloved, we don't put God at our disposal by being good enough. You know, I did this for you today, God. What are you going to do for me? It doesn't work that way. This is the Lord of the universe that we are dealing with. He asked for mercy. It's incredible. I think had Bartimaeus presented his case based on merit, there would have been no stopping, there would have been no healing, there would have been no invitation, there would have been no anything. But the cry for mercy changed everything. We see the same thing. Remember, it's the same thing we saw, remember back at the beginning of Luke 18? How the two guys went up to the temple, remember that? And the Pharisee prayed and he listed all of the meritorious things in his life. He tithed everything. He fasted twice a week. He listed what a great guy he was, gave alms to the poor. He listed all the things he did. And then here comes this poor tax collector who knows who he is because society has told him well who he is. And he says, Lord, have mercy on me. And remember how Jesus said, though, that's the one who went away justified. The other one did not. You can't bring your merit to God. You have no merit to bring to God. It's nice that you're a nice guy. It's nice that you're a nice person. It's wonderful. It means nothing to God because he knows why. He knows the selfish motivation between our good deeds. So the hope for spiritual blindness and not in rehearsing our meritorious service to God won't work. But the cry for mercy will stop the Lord of the universe instantaneously to respond. That's a wonderful thing. It takes humility to open God's heart, not arrogance. Forgive me for another baseball story, but, you know, they just come naturally, folks. What can I tell you? Babe Ruth was the highest paid baseball player of his time, of course. His salary was $80,000 a year when no one else was making anywhere close to half that. And then came the Great Depression in the early 30s, and somebody came out, you know, well, his, his employer asked him to take a cut. Ed Barrow was the general manager of the Yankees at the time, and he said, babe, you need to take a cut. Times have gotten hard. And Ruth said, take a cut. I'm not going to take any cut. Have I cut down on my home runs? And Ed Barrow had what he thought was, you know, the ultimate argument. He said, well, listen, babe, you, even the president doesn't make $80,000. And Babe Ruth says, yeah, but I had a better year than he did. <laughs> I guess he had a point. But true or not, do you see that when we bring our merit, when we bring our goodness to God and say, God, here it is, what we're really saying is, I had a better year than Jesus did. I have more to offer you than Jesus did. You need not have sent Jesus to live the life I couldn't live and die the death that I'm about to die if I don't accept him. You needn't have done that in my case. I had a better year than he. That's what you're saying. And that is exactly as blasphemous as it sounds. He did not bring his own merit. He asked for mercy. And because he asked for mercy, beloved, the whole world opened up to him. One cry for mercy. That's the solution. 
So he saw himself correctly, he saw clearly, he saw the Savior clearly, he saw solution clearly, and finally he saw salvation clearly. Verse 42, Jesus said to him, recover your sight, your faith has made you well. So did the man get his eyesight? Yes, he did. But that's not what that verse says. What that verse says, and we've seen this before in Luke, and I don't know why the translators keep doing this, they all do it. That verse says, your faith has saved you. That's what the verse says. Sozo. Your faith has saved you. Yeah, you got your eyesight back, but listen, that is nothing compared to what happened to you on the inside. You're seeing things clearly now that you never saw before. You have been saved spiritually. Your faith has saved you. It immediately calls to mind Ephesians 2.8, doesn't it? For by grace you have been saved same word, same exact word. So, so by, faith, by grace you have been saved through faith. And that, not of your own works, is a gift of God. It tells us a couple things, you know. It tells us, well, this man was healed physically. He was also saved spiritually. And that verse in Ephesians tells us that even the faith to do this was not his own. That too was a gift of God. So we can say all we want about how all the things that happened that might have led him to this point, but the faith was itself a gift of God. To him, it looked like he exercised what he had, but it was a gift of God. It reminds us of Jonah. When Jonah was in the belly of the whale in Jonah 2.9, what did he pray? Salvation is of the Lord. It is absolutely of the Lord. It is nothing of me. It is all of God. God made the objective uh, 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 way to have salvation available through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and God makes the subject of faith available as a gift. We have to exercise it. God makes it available. It's all him, lock, stock, and barrel. And this man, this man got that. We know he got it because look at verse 43. Immediately he recovered his sight and he followed him glorifying God. Now that's interesting. Why isn't he glorifying, you know, he's glorifying God. Why didn't he glorify himself if he thought it was his faith that had done this? Man, I look, at, look at me, I exercised faith and look what Jesus did because of my faith. He didn't do that. He didn't even glorify Jesus. He glorified God because he saw where this all leads. This is the only way to God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. This man had experienced salvation by grace through faith through Jesus Christ, the only way to the Father. So he glorifies God and the whole community joins him in glorifying and praising God. What a beautiful story. This man got salvation and he walked away seeing with 20-20 vision, not only physically but spiritually. So I'm compelled to ask, as we close the service this morning, you know, perhaps St. Corinthians 4.4 4 is true of you today. Maybe as an unbeliever, maybe as a believer who just has kind of, yeah, you, you've come to faith in Christ, but you've been living differently over the last few years. St. Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. But perhaps that's been true of you even as a believer. You're going your own way. You've decided you know better than God. Some of the commands that, that he gives that you don't like, you've put aside. If this is you, either way, as an unbeliever or as one who is a long ways from the Lord, then the Lord has brought you here for a purpose this morning. There are no accidents in God's universe. He's brought you here so you can see yourself clearly for who you really are. A sinner in constant need of repentance. And then accepting the forgiveness of God and rejoicing in it. He's brought you here to see the Savior clearly as the one who came to seek and to save that which is lost. He's brought you here so that you could see the solution clearly, not your merit or mine, but the mercy of God. How do you get that? Just like Bartimaeus did, you asked for it. Have mercy on me. Some of you, as I look around, have been around long enough, a few, to remember the first man in space. Remember? It was not Alan Shepard. 
He was three weeks later. The first man in space was Yuri Gargarin. Somebody sent him over here. You remember him. You're old enough, aren't you? Okay, sorry. Yuri Gagarin, the Russian who went up into space. He actually made rotations around the Earth three times. Alan Shepard went up and down, <laughs> but we could still say we'd been in space. Gargarian came back. He was famous for this quote. I looked and looked, and I never saw God. Coming from that God of society, he thought that would, I'm sure it made points for him. Some people even claimed he didn't say it. Khrushchev said it. It really doesn't matter. The following Sunday, W.A. Criswell, a great old preacher in Dallas, Texas, he got up in his pulpit and he said, uh, he said that, uh, that cosmonaut may, may not have seen God, but he said if he'd stepped outside of his spacesuit, he'd have seen God. <laughs> he was right, wouldn't he? See, all of, us are, all of us are alive by common grace, right? We're alive because God has chosen to give us time to come to repentance. Romans 2, 4 says, don't, you know, don't take the patience of God for granted. It's been granted so that you can come to repentance. That's the purpose for God's patience. So we're all living by common grace. That's why we are alive today. It's through the grace of God. We have this moment. The problem is we don't know how long the moment is, right? Gargarin was in perfect health at age 34. He'd been up in space and not seen God. But at age 34, in perfect health, he died. He died in a plane crash, in a routine flight, completely unexpectedly, no particular reason for it, just equipment failure. And he died at the age of 34. And I'll tell you what, if you'd never seen God before, he saw him then. Because it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Do you have the blinders off? Spiritual blindness, such a horrible condition to be in. Listen, beloved, if there's even the slightest pull on your heart and life this morning, whatever, even if you don't get all this, you don't understand it, you're not sure about it, you, you have doubts, listen, listen to me, please. If you're being pulled at all by the Holy Spirit today, plead for mercy. Ask God to take the blinders off. And you know what? He will. He will. He will. But you must ask. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this wonderful illustration from the physical world of the truths of the spiritual world. We thank you for the salvation readily available because of what Jesus is about to do in Jerusalem as we work our way through this book. What to us now, of course, is ancient history, but nevertheless, the pivotal point, not only in history, but in every life of every person who ever lives. So would you please remove the blinders, Lord, of anyone who may be here without you, young or old. Take them off. Let them see you in all your wonder, in all your beauty, in all your holiness, in all your glory. And then help them to reach out in faith and say, Lord, have mercy on me. And thank you that if they will do that, you will. Help us now as we sing to let this be Lord, the prayer of our heart. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.